Check, check. Yep, we're good. Welcome, everyone. It's nine o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, go ahead and turn your Bibles to John. Well, let's start in Exodus 3. Turn to Exodus 3, verse 14. Today we're going to talk about the I am statements that are found in the Gospel of John. There's seven of them that we're going to talk about. That phrase is actually used a couple of other times. But these statements all follow the same pattern. So we're going to talk about them um, at following this basic pattern. In Exodus 3, verse 14, we re, or 13 and 14, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So here God is telling Moses, this is my name. And what was his name? I am. And so this phrase is a phrase that the Jews would have been really familiar with. Um, because they knew that God called himself I am in the Old Testament. And so as Jesus started using these phrases, I believe then. Uh, with everything in our New Testament and Old Testament, there was a purpose to these statements. And that purpose we're going to talk about as we keep going um, today. But the, the main idea is that that phrase, I am, connected Jesus with God personally. Now, each one of these seven statements follows the same basic pattern. It starts with I am, and then it tells the listeners something else. And so, we're just going to dive into these quickly because we may run out of time, depending on how much y'all participate uh, and how fast we get the mics around. John 6, verse 35 is the first one that we're going to use. John 6, verse 35. In John 6... Well, let's start with verse 30. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. At his, his, as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. And so this discussion begins with, talking about manna and they're talking about how God uh, provided manna for them throughout the Old Testament and Jesus is saying that's not the bread that is most important. Verse 33, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. But I say to, or said to you that you have seen me and yet did not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on that last day. Now, in this chapter, there's an event that started the chapter. If you flip back, you'll see what that event was. It was Jesus feeding the 5,000. And if you've ever taught any group, you know that it's more meaningful to the students if you have a real-life situation that they can understand. So for example, when I teach postmodern theory of crime, I can't teach it well. I don't understand it. There's really no situation that I can talk about that makes it easy for them. But when I talk about driving while black or driving while white, because I was telling yesterday I got pulled over in downtown Lexington one night for driving while white. I was buying some propane tanks at like 11 o'clock at night and they pulled me, is it a bad neighborhood? They pulled me over and told me I was looking for prostitutes and drugs. And I said, no, I have two propane tanks in the back of my car. 
And he said, I don't believe you. And I said, I'll get out and show them to you. They're right here. So we went back and forth. And eventually he decided, he just told me to leave the neighborhood and don't come back. So when I tell the story, all of you are listening. You're saying, wow, really? Driving wild white? I've never heard of that concept. And so that's what Jesus was doing here. He was talking about, he had just fed 5,000. And so he uses it while they're there with their bellies full. He's talking about this bread. And he goes back to, or they go back to the manna. But he says, that's not the most important bread. The bread that I'm telling you about, the bread that I'm going to feed you with is spiritual bread, the bread of life that he is providing to them. Verse 41, the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Last week, we talked about the fact that a lot of the Jews questioned Jesus because they knew him. They knew his origin. This is another place where they are not believing Jesus because he is saying, I came down from heaven. And they're saying, no, he came from Joseph and Mary here on the earth. And so they still aren't get grasping that. Verse 43, Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from, learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except he, is, he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life, I am the bread of life. And so the bread of life analogy is not a earthly bread. It's an eternal bread, a spiritual bread. That bread that Jesus gave to them to allow them to have salvation. Um, any questions or comments on that one? The bread of life. Raise your hand, we'll bring you a mic. What do you got, Cam? Can you repeat that for me, Lee? Okay. Um, so what I think Cam said, might have said, I have really no idea what Cam said, was that the bread of life was Jesus and he was a very important part um, of our, sorry, is a very important part of our salvation. Um, now let's go to the second I am statement, John 8, verse 12. John 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. During the context for this particular statement was the feast of the tabernacles. And the feast, at the feast of the tabernacles, according to the Jewish history literature, there's a huge candle bar that was lit in the women's court of the temple and it reminded the Israelites of the pillar of fire. What did the pillar of fire do? Guided the tabernacle. Correct. It guided the Israelites as they moved throughout the wilderness. And so Jesus says here, I am the light of the world. Now, is he talking about darkness that he is doing away with in terms of what happens at one o'clock in the morning, usually? No. He's talking about sin and spiritual darkness. And so he's talking about when he says, I am the light of the world, he is saying that he is the light that brings us to Christ. That if we follow him, like the Israelites did that light in the desert, then we will end up in God's presence. And here in chapter eight, if you go to verse two, early in the morning, he came again to the temple all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. And if you keep following along, um, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to sown such women. So what do you say? This they said to test him that they might have some charge to bring against him. And then as we know, Jesus bent down and wrote in the sand. 
But the context of this statement is the early morning. Somebody just opened the door in the back. When they opened the door, that light hit me right in the eyes as I was looking up. So that light is meaningful to me because it was blinding me. In the early morning, if you're talking, and we don't know which way Jesus was facing, but more than likely, somebody in that audience was looking into the sun as Jesus is making this statement. And so that light that he's talking about was something that they would be very familiar with. And in reality, they were probably feeling and seeing it right then and there. Why is that light so important for us today? Light is life. Sin is death. Okay. What Jack said is light is life and sin is darkness and death. Well, he said sin is death. And I added sin is darkness and death. And so the light that we have in our lives today is Christ. We as Christians are supposed to reflect that light so that when we enter a room, if it's a room dark with sin, we bring the light of Christ into that darkness where we can light up the light or the room as we go into that room. Um, all of you have been in situations where you were in a dark room, somebody lit a light, and it lit the entire area. How many of you have been on a cave tour? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up if during the cave tour they said, everybody turn out your lights and don't turn on the light at all. Okay, you can put your hands down. Um, it gets really dark in a cave. Because the, the first time I went, the guide said, you can wave your hand in front of your face. You won't see your hand. I said, man, he don't know what he's talking about. So once it got dark, I waved my hand in front of my face and I couldn't see my hand. And I said, boy, it is dark. But on a couple of the tours I went, somebody decided it would be really cool to open their cell phone while this darkness is going on. And that little bit of cell phone light lit up everything around there. And so when we have that darkness of sin, when we are that light, we can light up the sin or light up the people in sin around us. Tom, you look like you have something to say back there. Tom has nothing to say. Ron does, however. So Mike's bringing it to you. Go ahead, Mike. You're getting it right now. If you'd have been here on time, we would have had it for you when you got here. That's hurtful. <laughs> I was going to just share this, this story. I was diving one time, and it was, it was a, cave, what, a wreck penetration dive. And I was inside the engine room of this wreck. And there is no light that penetrates into those things when you get to the interior of them. And I had a buddy down there with me, but he was in another part of the engine room. And I made this turn, and I thought I was heading for the exit but I ran into just a, a bulkhead. And so at that point, I thought to myself, am I lost inside this thing? And am I going to become a statistic? And so your heart's in your throat. And one of the things that I thought to do was that you're taught to do is I, of course we have lights down there and I just covered my light with my hand and his light was over across the way. And when I saw that light, I thought, I'm saved. And so um, that's a very good parallel to me to this darkness and light. Absolutely. The idea you're talking about. Absolutely. So if we're in the darkness, we can see that light of Christ. And no matter where we're at, we can see that light. And so we can go to that light. And so Ron's example is a great example. All right, let's go to the third one. John 10 seven through nine. John 10, seven through nine. But we're going to begin with verse one. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. 
this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, he's talking about something they're very familiar with, the shepherds. Um, and so the, as he goes into this, he says that the sheep recognize the shepherd and they will follow the shepherd. They won't follow somebody that's not a shepherd or their shepherd because they don't recognize the voice. Verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and, go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is, a, well, I'm already getting into the fourth one, but we'll keep going. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am a, the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and lay down my life for the sheep. So these two particular statements, he's talking about the shepherd. In the first one, he says, I am the door of the sheep. Now, according to what I've read, what they did at night when they were in areas that had these, they had like a corral or a stall or a gated area, fenced area. That's what they're called. And so he would, the shepherd would get all the sheep inside that fenced area, and then he would lay in the door. He would sleep in the door. Now, there have been times when I was on scout outings that I have slept in the door of rooms. Now, when I sleep in the door of rooms with scouts, it's not to keep people out. It's to keep scouts in because I don't have a lot of talents, but I am a great door block and door holder. And so whenever I lay down in a door, if somebody, unless they can, because I usually sleep on my side, unless they can jump quietly, they're not leaving that place. The shepherd's purpose was not to keep the sheep in. The shepherd's purpose was to keep the predators out. And so he was willing to sacrifice his own body and his own life to keep the predators out. That is the door of the sheep. And in that analogy, he says the only door, the only way for the sheep to go is to follow me because I am the good shepherd, which is the fourth statement. Now, if you were paying attention as we read that, he's contrasting good shepherds with bad shepherds. Who are bad shepherds? Hold on, Gabe, we'll get you a mic. Thank you. Bad shepherds are ones that, that basically either do nothing or just let the, pardon the expression, let the wolves come straight in. Sure. And so the bad shepherds are those ones that are not tending to the health of the flock. The ones that, for example, a wolf comes up. He points out, what's a hired hand going to do? He's leaving. He ain't my sheep. I ain't worried about him. I'm going to go save my life and let the owner of the sheep worry about them. But the shepherd, the good shepherd, is the one that really cares for his sheep. And I believe by using this phrase, the good shepherd, he's also talking about casting dispersion, would it, as you could say, on their previous shepherds, the Jewish leaders who had led them and led them wrongly in many situations where they were telling, for example, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And Jesus is saying, I'm the good shepherd. I am the one that's going to lead you to heaven. Go back to Psalm 23, one of the most familiar scriptures for many of us. This is the example of a good shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. One of the things that a good shepherd did was lead the sheep in a place where it was most comfortable for them. And sometimes that place that was most comfortable for them was kind of hard for them to get to. But the shepherd would know where the most fertile patches were and he would lead the sheep to these places. He would give them, as David said here, those green pastures and still waters. Why do sheep need still waters? Physically, they cannot drink running water. Okay. Not how they were made. So, it's a much of a river. Sheep can't drink it. Correct. Sheep can't drink running water. How many of you, when you think of smart animals, put sheep right there in your top three? Raise your hand. Good. You're, you're correct. They're not, I don't know what the smartest animal is. I know it's never been any of the dogs that I've owned, and I hear there are smart dogs. But sheep are some of the dumbest animals that would ever, that have ever been created. And if one of those sheep fell off into running water, they would probably drown. And so would every other one. Why? Because they would follow it. They would think this is intentional. This sheep went in the water, so I need to go in the water too. And then they just keep going in the water and keep going in the water. Luckily, when you were parenting and you used the phrase, well, if Joe jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? Because all of you used Joe or Sally or Bobby or whoever it was. If you were raising sheep, they'd say, hey, oh yeah, I'm gone. Falling right there with them. And so the purpose of still water is to protect them, to give them sustenance or sustenance, and then allow them to be safe as well. Verse four, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, you comfort me. The shepherd's rod was a powerful tool. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, depictions of that shepherd's rod. Most of the ones that I've seen are about eight foot, seven foot, eight foot long, a really solid stick that, was, that has a hook on the end. And so if you've ever had a seven or eight foot long stick, you can beat a lot of animals with a seven or eight foot long stick. You can also prod them, but the hook was for those sheep that don't know where they're going and stumble off somewhere so he could just hook them up and bring them back. And so that rod and that staff, that's a very important part of the shepherd's repertoire. And so David is saying here, because you are with me, because you have your rod and staff, I am not fearful. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I should dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, do you think Jewish children knew that psalm? Absolutely. Probably from a very young age. And so when Christ is talking about the shepherd, the good shepherd, they, many of them probably had this psalm in their head. Because I know that some of you, when I said the good shepherd, many of you immediately thought of Psalm 23. And they were raised, many of them, learning this as well. And so that good shepherd was something that would be meaningful to them as well. Any questions or comments on the shepherd in the door or the good shepherd? Hold on, Jack. There are not a lot of sheep in our particular area, and most of us really don't know about sheep. Um, my dad had a brother who lived in Boise, Idaho many years ago. And he was the chief herder of an operation that ran thousands of sheep. And they would break them up into groups of hundreds. And my dad went out and spent a week with them. They ride horses. Uh, they have their supplies flown in by helicopters. And they never leave these sheep. They're with them night and day. And my dad asked his brother, do you really know the name of every one of these sheep? And he said, well, I know enough that enough will follow me that the rest of them will follow. But he says they pamper them. Uh, they could stand in the middle of weeds 
and not eat if there was not another sheep around to eat. And he said it was amazing um, how needy sheep are. You just have to, they're like children. You just have to take care of them. So for Jesus to use this, that he's the shepherd, we're the children that need taken care of. Absolutely. Even when we don't admit it. I mean, we are just as needy as the, the sheep in the, in the animal world. And Jack reminded me of something I almost said earlier, but I'm going to say it now. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm staying in Onisha and Chuck's basement. I don't know why they're so kind, um, but they let me stay in their basement when I'm here. And last week, as I was getting in the truck to come somewhere, I looked over at their neighbor and there's these two big old white things. And like Jack said, I hadn't seen a whole lot of sheep. So I thought those were real sheep. And so the next time I saw Anisha, I said, are those sheep back behind your neighbor's house? And she said, no, they're blow up things. And so there are these huge blow up things that I guess they had out for yard decorations or whatever. But to me, they looked like sheep. I thought they were big sheep, like three times the size of any sheep I ever saw. But we're just not, maybe I'm, I'm not going to project me onto you, but I'm just not familiar with sheep. And so um, I believe everything that Jack says, because everything I've heard says the same thing. Did you ever go visit your brother out there? No, I never did first. All right. Any other questions or comments on the sheep? Nick has one back there, Ralph. John, you, you got one? Did you have your, okay. This is a thought I've kind of been having as we talked about the light and darkness as well, but it still kind of, I think, fits. And that was the, the word direction just keeps coming up to me because I think in any kind of severe darkness, whether it's in a cave or whatnot, you know, I think about the number of times that I've chosen to walk through the house without the lights on because I don't want to deal with it. And that ends up with a stub toe. But, you know, I think it's a lot harder for us at times to think of it in terms of the sheep and the shepherd because... I think sometimes we lack that humility to think I'm stumbling around in darkness, whether I perceive it or not, without Christ, without that direction. And I think um, that's where we need to take the story and, and really ponder on ourselves, you know, how much of a sheep are we truly? Because I think a lot of times we think, no, I've got this figured out and I'm not stumbling around in the darkness because I think I can see. Absolutely. And both of these, as Nick points out, are about direction. We, as humans, particularly in America, we like to think we can do anything on our own. And it's hard for us to admit publicly that we just can't do it without God. And so that humility that is required for us, some of us have real big problems with. But Christ tells us that we got to do it. Turn to John 11. John 11 Verse 25 is where we're going to read. But this is the story of Lazarus and the death of Lazarus. We're going to pick up in verse 17. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Martha's understanding of the resurrection was not the correct understanding according to the Jewish tradition. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection that we believe in. They believed that there would come a time when the bodies would be resurrected. But they didn't understand that they would be transformed. And so Martha didn't have a real good understanding of the resurrection. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall not die, never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is coming into this world. And so Jesus' statement here is a statement of hope for all of us because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Our only hope of resurrection comes through Jesus. Had Christ not been resurrected, we wouldn't have a hope 
of being resurrected either. And so that life that Christ is talking about after resurrection, it's not an earthly life. It's that eternal life that we are all seeking. Um, the resurrection of Lazarus is only recorded in this book. And so when we think about the book of John and the messages in John, this is a really important lesson for us, this resurrection and the life. Um, what were the group of people who called, or the group of Jews called that didn't believe in the resurrection? Sadducees. And so there were even Jews that didn't believe at all in the resurrection. And many of them that believed didn't have the correct understanding. And so when Jesus came and told them, I'm the resurrection and the life, that was troubling for them. Because he had, he's saying, I have the power to resurrect Lazarus and all of us. And that resurrection will lead to eternal life. Any questions or comments on the resurrection? I am the resurrection. Okay. Let's go to number six. Yes. Okay. Mike, just leave him the mic. It's easier. No, you don't need to do that. But in 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is, seems to be drawing some distinction between those two resurrections. I believe that my belief in Jesus, I, I know that I will rise again, there will, that there will be a resurrection, and my belief in Jesus is what, I'm going to say, um, when I rise again, I will be in heaven, to simplify things. Is that the distinction that he's drawing here? It's a little confusing to me. I, he, he's drawing some distinction between those two resurrections, and I'm not fully understanding what it is. I believe you're correct. I believe that the resurrection he's talking about is our own resurrection or into eternal life, his followers resurrection into eternal life, not the physical resurrection that they are thinking about at that time. It's a good point. There will be a physical resurrection. Correct. But it won't be the bodies, the physical bodies we had. It'll be our souls and our spirits and they'll be transformed. And I think that's where they got messed up, and a lot of them did, in their understanding of the resurrection. Good point. All right, John 14, 6. Let's begin with verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Go to verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And so these are kind of the bookends of Jesus' talk here. He begins with, y'all need to stop worrying. Don't let your hearts be troubled. And he ends with, don't let your hearts be troubled. Yesterday, I went to um, the Valvoline, the new one. I tried to get in the old one one time and I gave up really quickly. But... I don't know how much y'all know about my driving, but I get my oil changed every two weeks. Um, and usually it's over the 3,000 miles that I was supposed to have changed it at. And so the manager recognizes me. And so when I pulled up there, he goes, hey, it's good to see you again. He said, you're back quick. I said, yeah, my son went on his honeymoon and put an additional 3,000 miles on my truck. Um, and so we got to talking and everything, and he was very kind and nice, and he gave me the special treatment. But as I was sitting there listening, they were swamped. And he, I heard him say three times to his employees, it's okay, calm down, we got this. You're doing great, you're doing fine. Because they were running around like chickens with their head cut off. And he was trying to reassure them, it's gonna be okay, that we got this. And that's what Jesus is using this for right here. He's telling them, it's going to telling us it's going to be OK. I got this. Now let's go to verse two. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Now he tells them, you know this, you know the way to where I'm going. Verse five, Thomas said to him, 
Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Many of you have been in groups where they were saying, you know this, and you're thinking, I got no clue what he's talking about. But yet you were scared to ask. And then somebody else raised their hand and said, look, teacher, I have no idea what you're talking about. And you hear this collective sigh of relief in the room because most of the people have no idea what they're talking about. That was me in every computer science class I ever had and most of the math classes I ever had. I was always waiting on somebody else to ask the question because I was afraid I didn't know enough to even ask the question. But Thomas is verbalizing the thoughts of many of them. Jesus, we don't know what you're talking about. How can we know the way? Verse six, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. It's really clear there what Jesus is saying. There's only one way to get to God, and that way is through Jesus. It couldn't be any clearer than that right there. And I won't name a bunch of religious leaders that say the way to God is through them, and there are many. But John 14, 6 tells, tells all of us that's wrong. There's only one way to God. And that way is through Christ. And because he says that way is through Christ, we now know the way. Ron's example a minute ago reminds many of us of situations where we bumped up against something and we thought we were lost. And we thought, I don't know how to get to where I'm going. And so... I always have an atlas when I'm taking a long trip. Why do I carry an atlas? Find your way. To find my way. And most of the time, the phones I got are either dead or the GPS is off or something. And in Mississippi, there are lots of places where GPSs don't work. And so if you don't have a map, you get somewhere and you have no idea where you're going. Most of you spent your 21st birthday a little bit differently than I spent mine. I don't know how you spent yours, but I guarantee you very few of you did this. We were in the jungles of Panama, and I was part of an element. We were doing a land nav course. There were eight of us. We had a butter bar lieutenant, for those of you that know what that means, who was unwilling to admit that they had no idea where they were going. And so we got lost in the woods. I mean, bad, bad lost. And in Panama... The jungle canopy is so thick that there's, you can't see the sun. You can't even use the sun as a direction. And so my 21st birthday, I dehydrated in the jungles of Panama. They called in a medevac, and they said, we can't get to you because we can't drop the jungle penetrator through, through that heavy canopy. They said, you got to walk out. And I said, that pretty much tells the story of my life right there. I'm dehydrated, and they say, you got to walk further. Um, so I got up to a place where I fell, I passed out. They, I woke up in the hospital with two IVs in me. And to this day, if I ever see that lieutenant again, I'm going to say, look, we'd have been a whole lot better off if you had admitted you got no idea where you're going. Because we all knew he had no idea where he was going, but he was unwilling to admit that. Um, I know some of you ladies are sitting here and say, well, that's a genetic trait of all you dudes that are sitting here in the audience. Let me tell you, it's not a genetic trait of Dave. Dave has been lost a lot, and Dave has no problems asking directions. Because if we don't know where we're going, we're never going to get there. And Christ tells us, you don't have to worry. I am your GPS. I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you want to get to God, this is the way. And that gives us reassurance that we know how we can get to heaven as well. Any questions or comments on I am the way? Hold on, Jack. I'm just reminded that us country folks give directions differently than non-country folks. Country folks, you go down here about two miles and turn right at the big oak tree. Uh, you'll pass a pig pen, a big barn on the right, et cetera, et cetera. And... Uh, a lot of places that I've been, I know exactly where I'm going, but I couldn't tell you the address, and I probably couldn't tell you how to get there. That's right. But I just do it. And if we take the wrong direction, we're going to wind up in the wrong place. And that's why we have to follow Christ, because it's the right place and the only place. Absolutely. And I don't know if y'all do this 
around Richmond, but in Starkville, Mississippi, they change grocery stores about every five years. So this one building that is coming, becoming Ace Hardware, since I've been there, and I've only been there 12 years, was a Piggly Wiggly of vowels, and before that, I can't remember what it was. And they give directions, you turn right at the Piggly Wiggly. Well, the Piggly Wiggly left like six years ago. How am I supposed to turn right at the Piggly Wiggly? Um, and so some of you have had that same experience. There ain't no Piggly Wiggly in Star. Well, how am I going to turn right at the Piggly Wiggly? And so having good directions, as, as Jack points out, is so important. Go ahead. And, and then they say, you can't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, it's interesting. I, I met with somebody yesterday. And she lives, that's what reminded me of the Driving Wild White story because I was telling it to them yesterday because they live in that neighborhood. And she said, there's going to be a man on the side of the building. You can't miss it. So I'm looking for like the Marlboro man with a cowboy hat and, you know, that kind of man. That's this rock looking dude whose face is painted on the building. And I told her, I said, I almost missed it. It's a different kind of man than you were talking about. And so... We all can miss it. And that's Christ's point is that we will miss it if we don't follow him and follow his way. And then turn to John 15, 1 through 5. This will be the last one we talk about. Well, that's the last one that there is to talk about. Verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. The vine was something they are very familiar with. Um, wine was an important part of their culture. And so they knew grapevines. And they knew how the vine worked. The vine brings sustenance to the fruit. And without that vine, those fruit are going to die. And so Christ is saying here that I am this vine. I am the one that brings sustenance to you. Verse 8, but by this my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I loved you. Christ says he is the vine. And then he says, this is how you bear fruit. Love one another as I have loved you. And so this idea of the vine providing us his fruit as sustenance is a great analogy for us as well. And what happens to vines that don't bear fruit? They get pruned off. And the reason they get pruned off is they want a vine to come back that will actually bear fruit. And according to this verse 6, or yeah, 6, they're gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. That's what will happen to us if we don't bear fruit. Ron. In in verse 5, I'm struck by this, by this phrase that he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that strikes me, and I may be misinterpreting this, but to me that says, we will, we will if, we are, if we are vines on this, on the, if we are branches on this vine that is the Lord, our good works will be evident. But there are lots of people who are not a part of the vine, and they still do good things. But it says to me that those good things are worthless. They may do lots of good things. They may build libraries and schools and do all kinds of good things, but they are, at their core, worthless 
because they do not glorify God. Absolutely. And the counter to that is we aren't saving anybody. That we are, when we bear fruit, it's because Christ is bearing fruit through us. And you hear people talk about um, the number of folks they baptize. Who cares how many people somebody baptized? Because Christ is the one that's bringing him to him, not the human that's talking to them. The human is the vehicle through which the gas is getting there. And we have run out of time. Thank you for your comments and your questions. And we will see you next week.
Testing. There we go. Here we are. Good to see you. Keep visiting if you want, but I'm going to talk right over you. I finally made it up here, making my rounds. Now we're glad to be together, have a chance to worship God. And uh, we have a number of people visiting with us today. And hope you'll look around and notice. In fact, just right now, look around. Everybody look. See if you see somebody you don't recognize. You see anybody? Okay. I want you to, we have a future Colonels for Christ student here. I want you to find them today. I'm not going to give you any hints except that they're sitting back there. Uh, and there's a connection that they have with us. They used to be at the same church that we were in Arnold, Missouri, but they were there many years later. But anyway, you can find them. And then uh, I also know that the lobster and the princess are here. Yep, Sebastian and Ariel are here. You don't believe it, but it's true. I hope you find them. I've already found them. They're, they're impressive people too. So see, we've got some visitors. So look around, get to know them. And we're glad that you're here. Today's a really, really special day for a lot of reasons. This afternoon, if you want to go, I'm going to Frankfurt for the service, the unity service that we're going to be having, um, bringing together our, our brethren from uh, different cultures. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, be leaving somewhere around 2 o'clock. Tonight, we're going to have one of our congregational Bible studies. And so when we get here together tonight, we're going to spend time discussing some things together in a Bible class and not traditional preaching. So if you want to be a part of that, love to have you come and be with us. So one more, met another family that's looking for a good place to live. I told them they're here. So be on your best behavior because you don't know who those people are. But if you're on your best behavior, then they're going to go, oh, that's right. He was right. This is the place. So just keep thinking about all that. All right, we're ready to get started. Tom's going to lead us as we do. Good morning, family. And if uh, Mike's remarks haven't made those of you who are visiting us understand that you are our honored guest this morning, I don't know what I can add to it. So this morning, our verse comes from Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, and it reads, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's read that scripture together. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Would you bow with me now as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer? Dear God, as we gather this morning in your name, in worship to you, we ask that you help each one of us to turn our hearts and minds away from the cares of the world, away from the trouble and conflict that surrounds us daily, away from our trials and our tribulations, and help us to focus and turn our hearts towards you, towards your love for us, towards your sacrifice for us, towards your constant guidance and care that you offer us each and every day as we walk this path on this earth. Father, we understand that we are feeble humans who are caught in this body of flesh. And being found in the flesh, Father, we understand that we undergo temptations and we have a overriding proclivity, Father, to constantly make decisions and pass bad judgments concerning our own lives that cause great harm and great difficulty in the lives that we lead here, Father. We ask that you help us to focus on the word which you so lovingly gave us, to focus on that word, to place it in our hearts, to write it on our, on our doorposts, Father, as the children of old did, so that we continually use sound judgment, Father. When decision time comes, that we might take your word, place it against our hearts, and make decisions that are just, decisions that are righteous, and decisions that keep us in the light, Father, that keep us on, keep us on the path towards, towards the final reward that you have set before us. Father, we thank you for the opportunities that you give us each and every day, Father, opportunities to serve you, 
opportunities to better ourselves through the knowledge of your word, through, the ser through service to others, through compassion and empathy for those who do not know you, Father. And it is on their behalf that we come before you this morning, Father, that you might open the eyes that are closed, open the ears that refuse to hear, and open the hearts that walk in paths of delusion, Father, that, and walk in paths of untruth, that they might see you for who you are, that they might see your word, that they might open their hearts and minds to you, Father, remove those delusions, and come into the light as he is in the light. Lord, we thank you so much for this family here at Richmond. We thank you for the love that we share, the care and consideration that we give one another each day so that together we can continue to walk hand in hand down the path that you've set before us to reach the final reward that you've promised us. Father, we have many this morning that are struggling, struggling with health, struggling with emotional issues, Father, financial issues, struggling with the cares and burdens that this world of flesh puts upon us each and every day. Father, you know who they are. Help us as we help them. Provide them the blessing that they need to continue to step forward in life, Father, to help resolve their problems, Father, and help them always to look unto you, Father, because regardless of what the outcome is of the trial or tribulation that they're facing, we know that as long as we remain in you, that in the end everything's going to be okay. Father, we thank you for our leadership here, Father. We ask that you bless each and every teacher, each and every minister, each of our deacons, our, our shepherds, Father, our, our preacher, our ministers, Father, that you bless them in their work, that you help their work to be successful, Father, and through their work, help us to build all of us, the entire family here, into the spiritual giants that you would have us to be. Help us always to walk in the light, Father, as he is in the light, and through that, continue to cleanse us of all of our sins, all of our poor decisions, all of the bad things that we attempt to do to ourselves, Father. We thank you so much for Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for each one of us. Help us to abide in that sacrifice, Father. Help us to, uh, to be, live lives that are worthy of that great sacrifice, Father, as we accept the blessing of the redemption that's found in his blood each and every day. Father, as we enter into worship this morning, be with each one who is gathered here. Bless all of the families that are represented here this morning, Father, and help us as we continue to walk our walk of righteousness through this world of trial and turmoil, Father. We thank you so much that you've given us this opportunity to come together this morning. We thank you so much that you've given us this avenue of worship to you so we can show our love and and. Uh, uh, our understanding of what you've done for us, Father. We ask that you be with us now as we enter into worship. Continue to watch over us. Continue to guide us. For this is our prayer in Christ's holy name. Amen. Oh, we pray things we have done. 
in every way so that you can be givers in every way. We we'll reading from 2 Corinthians 9 verses 6 through 11. The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work, as is written, he distributed freely, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now the one who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will also provide and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Now, what do we do with this? What's our application? First, generosity multiplies. God uses many agricultural parables throughout scripture that have a clear and a timeless application to our lives today. Think of a garden. Close your eyes with me for just a brief moment. Go back to a garden, whether it was one that you're planting now, one that you planted last year, one from your childhood, whatever, whatever it takes you back. Think of putting your hands in that soil, planting that seed. Smell, smell that soil. Feel that seed going into the ground and then taking your time, as we should do, to tend to that garden. To go back and watch that fruit or that vegetable grow. And then think about eating that when you're done with it. Just a few seeds yields so very much. And that is applicable to us today. And God encourages us to be generous in how it is that we sow the seeds that he has blessed us with, sowing those seeds for his glory and so that we can have a large yield for him. Second, 
Generosity brings about happiness. Think about a true servant in your life, someone who volunteers their time, their energies, their efforts, and does so happily. And look at the joy that they get, not out of what they might receive from it, but about what they can give to someone else and make someone else's life just a little bit better because they took their time to be that generous volunteer. Think about for us, God places you, he places me in specific moments, at specific places, in specific time. Don't say no when God places us in these positions or when we have the opportunity to do works for God because of the time and place and person that we are. Use that for God. Don't say no. Say yes to him and grow through service to him. And third, generosity begets more generosity. In the parable of the sower, we learn that the more generous we are, the more that God will trust us with. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to be financially rich. It may mean we are blessed with finances. It may mean we are entrusted with more talent, more ability, more education, more opportunity, more whatever the blessing, whatever the talent is that God has given us. When we sow generously, we will reap generously. We will be given more to be entrusted with so that we can sow the seeds of his kingdom. Bow with me, please. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we're indeed grateful for the many opportunities you present before each one of us as individuals and us as a group of people. We thank you for the shepherds who oversee the works that are done here and who oversee the distribution of the finances. We pray that these, may, that these seeds may have a large yield for you and your kingdom. We pray that you be with the deacons, the coordinators, the servants in each way, shape, and form, that you bless them and bless the works that they do and bless their hands as they do it. And most importantly, we thank you for each individual servant who actively chooses to serve you in what it is they do. For it is in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. I believe it was Monday of this week, I sent an email to John Mathis and Ken Johnston. And like I normally do, I forgot the T in Johnston. And so Ken replied back and said that he worked with someone who regularly did the same thing. And so he told him one time, he said... My name is Ken Johnson with a T. And so from that point forward, he called him Kent Johnson. Um, I'm working on getting Ken's name right. I'm just not real good with names. But our names, just like Ken's, are really important to us. Um, Starkville, Mississippi, is often pronounced Starksville, Mississippi. David May is often pronounced David Mays. And so whenever we hear that, we think, well, that's not the right name. I sure wish they'd get that name right. We have a name. Our name is Christian. According to the dictionary, a Christian is a person who has received Christian baptism. If you look at the actual Greek word, it means follower of Christ. And our name is very important to us. As a Christian, we have obligations to fulfill that name. Two things must have happened for us to wear that name. The first is that Christ must have been crucified. And we know that Christ was crucified for our sins. And to wear that name Christian, we must be baptized into his blood, into that eternal salvation. Every Sunday, we gather together, those Christians partake in the Lord's Supper. And as we do that memorial to Christ, that reminds us of why we wear that name and how important that name should be to us. In 1 Corinthians 15, we read, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received in which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then the twelve. When we partake in the Lord's Supper in just a moment, we need to remember that death, that burial, that resurrection, and why we wear that name Christian and give God the honor and praise that he deserves. Let's pray for the bread. Lord, thank you for this time, this time of communion. Lord, thank you for this bread, Lord. Help us to take it seriously as we come to you, Lord. In your most holy name we pray, amen.
pray for the cup. Dear God, we thank you for this wonderful and blessed day that you've given us, Lord. We thank you now for the blood that was shed on the cross for our sins. We thank you for it because we now have redemption through you. We are given salvation. And we just ask that you help us to remember the sacrifice that was given for us each and every day, Lord. Bless this cup and bless us. It's in Jesus' blessed name that we pray. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from Romans 5, verse 6 through 10. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When was the last time that you really pursued something? Or maybe someone. I mean, you really did. What did you do? Well, you were all in, right? Your effort was there. Your intention was there. You were focused. I am pursuing this. I recently learned about a woman who pursued the man she married. That's right. Maybe you did the same thing. Maybe it was a job. Maybe it was a hobby. 
I've known of people who have pursued hobbies so intensely that it got in the way of their families. And of course, there have been those who have pursued dangerous, harmful, addictive things that have damaged their lives and the lives of others. So when you think about pursuit, what do you think about? Today, that's our topic. And tonight when we have our congregational Bible study together, I want you to be thinking about how do we pursue God? And how do I know when I am? Or can I see when someone else is? But for this morning, we need to know that God has pursued us. Pursuit implies so many things that are strong and obvious and real. And when God has pursued us, we think about it in those terms. Doesn't it make you feel good? Doesn't it make you feel good to know that God pursued you? Why? Why did God pursue? What is it that drove him to pursue? If you leave your Bibles open to that Romans 5 passage, we will be there in just a few minutes. But I want you to think about this. I want to ask you this question. What is it that causes this pursuit? Well, if you think about maybe the job that you have or the, the degree that you're seeking in college or the relationship that you have or that you're wanting to have, pursuit is originated by pursuit's motive, pursuit's Motivation is desire. Desire. It is desire because it says, that's what I want. If you don't want it, you're not going to pursue it. It was Jesus who said in Matthew 5, in about verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They shall be filled. Those who desire it, hunger and thirst for it, they are the ones who are filled. And notice God. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. God desires you. God desires me. He therefore has pursued us because that's his motive. Grace is the energy behind the pursuit. Grace is God pursuing us. Not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by His grace. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. That's the energy. That's what keeps it going. It is His grace that is constantly keeping that pursuit alive. 
Grace, maybe we could say, is the life force of that pursuit. There's a great verse properly translated from the Greek in Ephesians 1 in verse 6. Wherein the text could be translated and helps us to translate it this way. For by his grace, he has graced us in the beloved. The New King James says, by His grace, He has made us accepted. But it's the same word. He, by His grace, graced us. Grace is the energy that sustains that pursuit. And relationship is the goal of the pursuit. Isn't that true in that romantic relationship that you have or are pursuing relationship? Isn't it also true that in a way of understanding it, no matter what it is you are pursuing, you want to have a relationship with it. You want it to be a part of your life. You want to be connected to it. You want to be with it. That's why you pursue it. It's your goal. Jesus told his disciples, I want you to learn this. Go your way, learn this. Learn what this means. I will have mercy, not sacrifice. For I've not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. What does God want? God wants relationship. Just like us in any pursuit, we want a relationship with it. God wants a relationship with you. God wants a relationship with me. He brought me into him. He calls me to him. God wants to be in relationship with us. In the text, why is it that God had to pursue us? Connection to last week. This is God's got to. In our text, read for us a few moments ago, we see that God's got to do this. God had to pursue us. Verse number six. Because we didn't have the strength to pursue him. When we were yet without strength, You see a little child, maybe lying in a crib, lying on the couch, sitting up, and the child's hands are extended in arms, and they're crying a little bit, and you look over there and you say, well, come on, come on. Now... I'm sure they don't have the mind to do this, but if they do, I can't. I can't get over there to you. (laughs) I don't know how to walk. I don't know how to crawl. You got to come get me. And then what the child is saying, God had to pursue us. Because we didn't have the ability on our own to pursue him. Mankind was without strength. 
No ability on our own to do it. Verse number eight. God had to pursue us because we were running away from him. Your child grows up. Isn't it interesting? When the little one is, you're carrying them around and, you know, you sort of think, man, I'll be so glad when they grow up enough to walk on their own. And then they get there. Oh, why did I ever want that? Because I'm constantly chasing them. Don't you go over there. Don't you go over there. Come back over here. And you chase them down. Why? Because that's what children do. They run away. God had to pursue us. Because in our sin... We were running away from him. And yet, he came running after us. We run after that child because we know the danger the child might could get into. God came running after us because he knows the danger of the sin that we are in. Verse 10, God had to pursue us because we were actually fighting against him. We were enemies. A child finally grows up, gets into those wonderful magical teen years. And then the fights begin. Maybe they storm off. That's their way of fighting. Maybe they come at you and say, I want my way. But the parent holds the ground, stands firm, and in effect, continues to pursue this child for the child to be right and in a good relationship because you know they need the discipline. God pursues us because he knows that we don't need to be fighting him. Down deep, we know it. We don't want to fight him. We don't want to constantly be at odds with God. Instead of leaving us on our own, he continues to pursue us. Because he wants us to be better. So God pursued us through Jesus. Now Jesus has got to, but his attitude was, I get to. In our text, verse 7, he died for us. Jesus would say, greater love is no one than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. God had to pursue us. Through Jesus, he did. And in the pursuit of us, he showed his extreme, utter, and full commitment to us. As Jesus died for us, he took our place. 
Hebrews 2 and in verse 9, says the place he took was dying a death that we don't have to die. It's not physical death because we're all going to die there. But it's spiritual death. He died for us so that we don't have to face the death of being separated from God. He died for us. That was God's pursuit of us. Verse 9. He justified us. Oh, we were stained. Damaged. Wrong. He made it just if I'd never sinned in the first place. He took our broken selves and put us back together. You know, if you break something, maybe there's a, a piece of pottery. A piece of pottery from this area that you've had for a long time before they closed. Somebody breaks it. You can put it back together. You can put it back together and glue it and it, it'll, it'll do. But guess what? You'll still see the crack. You'll still see where the problem was. But when God puts people back together, you don't see the crack and the damage. Because it's been made just if I'd Never been broken in the first place. Verse 10. Through Jesus, he reconciled us. That piece of pottery, when it sold originally, had a price tag. You break it. You glue it up. You can still sell it. But the price tag, it's gone down because its values decreased. Jesus bought us back. Having sold ourselves into that sinful state, that broken state, he said, I'll buy you anyway. He didn't say, pass you look broken. You look ugly. You look cracked. I don't want you. Not only did he buy us back, he paid more than full cost. Think about this. What did God pay? What did it cost God to make us originally? He didn't go buy any ingredients anywhere. It didn't cost him anything. But what did it cost him to buy us back, to recreate us? Well, it cost Jesus everything. So in reconciliation, he has bought us back at a greater price than was ever paid in our original creation. Let me ask you a question as we close. Do you know that God is still pursuing you? He still is. God is pursuing you through His presence.
providential working. His providence. He puts people in your lives and puts you in places to meet people in your lives through whom he continues to pursue. Does he not? Don't you think? Doesn't God work that way? In pursuing you and in pursuing me, he works through people in certain places to say, I want you to be better. And through his patience, he continues to give you time Notice, to be caught. In his patience, he's given you time, finally, to be caught with his pursuit. He's not quit chasing. He's patient. When I fight against him, he's patient. When I run away, he's patient. When I claim I can't do anything, he's patient. And he continues to say, I'm pursuing you. If you're not a child of God, be grateful that God's patience has let you live till this moment. Because if you've never been immersed into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, He is patiently waiting for you to do that. I don't know how long His patience will last with you or me or with this entire world. But I know that right now, in this moment, at this time, his patience has said, here's another chance. You're going to take it or not? And for those of us who are children of God, He continues providentially to put people and places in our lives to encourage, to help, to build, to strengthen, and to challenge. Am I listening? Am I allowing that to happen to change me for the better? Well, here's another one of his providential opportunities. People are gathered in this place to pray for you to be better if that's what you need. God's pursuing you. Are you ready? To be caught if you haven't been while we stand and sing together. I've
Good morning. I suppose if you guys want to go and start getting the cards, we can uh, let that happen. If you guys can bring up that PowerPoint. I was asked to once again come up and plug some bits for Walk for Water. And to belabor the point, I uh, went to the kitchen right before this and grabbed a cup from the kitchen sink. And ironically, this little water bottle was sitting underneath the cups for some reason, so I grabbed it too. Um, just to make us reflect on the fact of how easy this is for us to get. Now, some of you will not drink tap water, I know. Some people have to have it filtered, but even that is pretty easy for us to get to. Um, but I was actually, as I was preparing this PowerPoint this morning, I was watching some of their uh, targeted, uh, their plans for the program of Walk for Water, uh, which is what we're talking about this morning. And essentially these villages, uh, the ones they're targeting in Kenya next, about three kilometers from a water source, and even that water source is not clean water. It's still water that has to be boiled and some attempts to filter it to get the actual physical uh, debris out and things like that just to be able to drink it. And I consider that every morning I stumble downstairs, one eye open, I get filtered water for my fridge and I make coffee and that is my morning routine. And I could not imagine if there were six miles to walk beforehand to get that water. Um, there we go. Looks like it is up now. It's not there, but all right. Um, I have this at the end as well, but, and I posted this on Realm uh, this morning too. Uh, the link is below, and if you prefer that way, but if you take a picture with your camera or hold it up, you can get the link as well. Um, so if you wanna go ahead to the next slide. Uh, these are pulled off their website, and I wanted to make a few things clear. Uh, you don't pay to register for this. Uh, you register if you're going to participate. Uh, they do that for two reasons. One, there will be food there and we need to know numbers. And two is uh, they provide you with a free t-shirt. Um, you can sign up and not walk or you can sign up and walk a short amount or you can sign up and you can walk uh, without carrying water. You can choose to carry the water. Um, the important thing here is that they want people to participate to reflect upon what other people have to go through and that is the lesson that is intended to be learned. Um, so the full distance, if you choose to participate and you choose to carry that water is four miles. And if you choose to sponsor it, their goal with every event is try to get $7,500. And that's because they're trying to build a well. Um, if you move to the next slide, a picture's worth a thousand words. Um, I'm not sure it ever comes across, but I wanted to show you this because it's not a youth event. This is a family's event. This is something that everybody here can participate in if you can uh, choose to walk or if you just want to sit and, and cheer the group on. Some carry water, some don't, um, but more it's the, uh, the chance to participate and get the knowledge out. Sprouts will be a part of it, so if you're planning on being at the next Sprouts event, this is something you're going to want to register for as well. Um, and if you want to help in one other way, that food, we are going to need help in that kitchen to um, organize the food, cook it, and, and put it out and serve. So if you'd like to participate in that additional way, you can do so as well. Um, take us to the next slide. This I put together this morning, you probably have to advance it one more to get it to play. It is playing. No, go back and try to, it's a video, see if it, you can click on it to get it to play. There we go. Cannot play, all right. Well, what you would have seen is uh, there are two things uh, to go, and I guess if you guys wanna pull up that website, we could try that. Um, you can register for the team, you can register individually uh, from that link. And as far as donations go, uh, we were talking about this morning, um, I believe Erica, you discussed anybody who wants to donate could just donate to the church and then we can cut a check, right? Um, as opposed to necessarily having to go through this portal to do so. But really what we're pushing people to do right now is get registered. We'd like to see more people participate. We got two families right now that are coming, but we'd like to see people get out and actually walk. If you choose you wanna to donate to that effort, that's fine, but we really want to get people registered to walk. Um, and if you have any questions, please come see me. And uh, of course that's on Realm and it's up right now but we'd really, really like to see people sign up for April 13th at 10 a.m. at Rolling Hills Bible Camp. Thank you.
I want to join everyone in welcoming uh, both our visitors and our regular members, and I want to remind everyone that right after I say the closing prayer, if you'll remain seated just a moment, we're going to recognize some of our children. Um, Howard McFadden was admitted to Baptist Health Richmond last night with a bowel obstruction. Please pray that they will be able to clear the obstruction without surgery. There's a prayer request for Tanya Longwest's brother, Joey Willoughby. He'll be having a heart cath tomorrow. We're asking for prayers for Cindy Burke. She has a tumor in her hip, has five radiation treatments coming up the first week of April, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then Monday, Wednesday of the next week. We appreciate all the prayers and cards, and that came from the Burks. Thank you to everyone who donated candy or eggs or who helped with the treasure hunt yesterday. We had a good time, but the lawnmowers may be finding eggs for quite a while, Robin and Nancy. In terms of other announcements, um, there are March and April sign-up sheets for the homeless lunches in the kitchen. We're in need of many items, and so thanks. We're also asked to announce help out a college student during the finals week by adopting them. If you're interested, see Bree McGaffey for details. And then volunteers are needed for VBS June 9th through 12th. Uh, please see Kim Seal for details for that. In terms of upcoming events, uh, the Sprouts, we're going to have lunch right after this and some fun activities. So if you're a spiritual Sprout, uh, please stay. Uh, we hope to see you this afternoon. Um, afternoon worship will be shortened, so the kids involved with Lads to Leaders will be showcasing their activities. So after evening worship, stick around for that. Women's Book Club is Monday, March 25th at Lydia, Ox Lind Lydia Oxford's home. Ladies' Night Out is Tuesday, March 26th at Logan Steakhouse here in Richmond. And the next con Central Kentucky area-wide singing is April 12th at North Lexington beginning at 7 p.m. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you for the time that we've had here together, Lord, and the message that Mike has delivered. Lord, we know that without you and your pursuit of us that we wouldn't have a chance for heaven. And we're so thankful to you for sending your son for that opportunity. Lord, as we depart from here, we ask that you bless those that have requested prayers. Lord, be with those that need your help, both physically and spiritually. Forgive us when we sin. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So continuing our tradition, as I call names, I'd like you to come to the stage. If you don't want to come to the stage and you're a young one, you don't have to come to the stage, um, but I'll be recognizing you. And so as I call your name, Aiden Brooks, C.J. Brown, Anderson Derringer, Griffin Derringer, Kaylin Gibson, Kylie Gibson, Wyatt Hunt, Connor McFadden, Jackson Oaks, Benjamin Riley, Tyler Madden, Angelique Ray, Charlotte Ray, Lori Riley, and Marley Riley. And while they're getting to the stage, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, the last time we did this was the end of January. And after we got done, uh, Y'all know the Oaks boys. I love those kids because they remind me so much of me and my brothers when we were that age. Jet came up and he said, Mr. Dave, you didn't call Jackson to the front. He did something. And I said, I'll get him next time. And I was wrong. Jackson's not here this time. So um, Jet was taking care of his brother, showing brotherly love. Okay, so let's see who we got. So CJ will get you last. Um, Anderson Derringer, Books of the New Testament and Ten Plagues. Griffin Derringer, raise your hand as I call your name. Days of Creation, 12 Sons of Jacob, they have learned these. Uh, Kaylin Gibson did the divisions of the Bible. Kylie Gibson did the divisions of the Bible and the 10 plagues. Wyatt Hunt learned his New Testament books. Raise your hand, Wyatt. There you go. Um, Connor McFadden learned the books of the Old Testament. Jackson Oates, the Ten Commandments. Benjamin Riley learned the books of the New Testament, the Days of Creation, and the Fruit of the Spirit. Tyler Madden learned the books of the Old Testament, Days of Creation, Through the Spirit, and the Twelve Sons of Jacob. Angelique and Charlotte Ray learned the Days of Creation, Fruit of the Spirit, Ten Commandments, Twelve Sons of Jacob, the Lord's Prayer, and 25 verses recited. Lori Riley, Old Testament books, New Testament books, Through the Spirit, and the Twelve Sons of Jacob. And Marley Riley, Old Testament books, New Testament books, Through the Spirit, Twelve Sons of Jacob, and the Army of God. So if everybody but CJ will go back to your parents, thank you, you hang out here CJ, so you guys can go home.
somewhere. <laughs> go ahead, Benjamin. Go see your folks. There you go. Okay. The reason CJ up here is because we have a special award for CJ. Um, before I present that award, I'll update you on what he's done since January. Um, and remember now, I only do the ones that they haven't been recognized for before. So since January, CJ has learned the 12 Apostles plus 2, the Ten Commandments, the 23rd Psalm, the Divisions of the Bible, the Armor of God, and the Lord's Prayer. And he now has memorized 100 verses. And so we have a certificate for CJ. If you come around here, CJ. And more importantly, huh? 110. Oh, 110, not 100. <laughs> and so, sorry about that. And so here's a gift card for CJ. Congratulations, bud. Thank you all. You're now dismissed.